thanks very much. <coughs> so yeah, um, just going to skip this slide. <laughs> okay, so the end of Roman rule in Britain has been seen as a fault line in British history, somewhat similar to the cliff edge predicted and guarded against for post-Brexit 2019. More than simply representing a break between Roman and non-Roman rule, this century also marks the beginning of Anglo-Saxon influence in Britain. Thanks to the combined efforts of Gildas and Bede, we have an explanation for any changes in material culture and behaviours associated with the 5th century. Gildas gives us a whole new people populating the east of the island, which I think we can safely interpret as Britain. And Bede goes even further and makes everyone in lowland Britain, outside of Wales and the southwest, descendants of these immigrants. The combination of these two written sources have allowed a degree of complacency to develop around the study of changes that develop in the 5th century. As a result of Bede and Gildas, we have an easy explanation for any change in behaviours in the 5th century, ethnic identity. Furthermore, Bede offers an explanation for any perceived differences between the actions of those immigrants. There are three different groups in play, each of which may have their own material culture and practices. As such, any aspect that does not easily fit within existing definitions could be described as differentiation between different incoming groups. This paper intends to demonstrate that ethnicity, whilst undoubtedly an important aspect of identity, need not be the deciding factor behind changes that occurred in Britain in the 5th and 6th century. As identity in the 5th century is a significant and wide-ranging subject, this paper will not attempt to answer, uh, answer what identities are in play, but demonstrate the flaws of using ethnicity as a catch-all explanation. There are multiple areas of study which can be seen to have an impact on this argument. These include DNA evidence, material culture and language development. Their study is undoubtedly important, as is, the, as, as is their impact. Indeed, the fact that English is the spoken language of Britain and not a variety of Celtic, such as Welsh, could be seen as one of the most cogent and difficult arguments against the position that the ethnicity of actors in the 5th century is given undes an undeserved primacy. However, the belief in the importance of this as an outcome has caused some difficulties in the study of the period, such as at, tithe, at times a belief in the um, apartheid between British and foreign populations, or ge genocide and ethnic replacement. The develop developing study of DNA could have significant potential in understanding the makeup of the population. However, at this point, DNA evidence is poorly understood, and the study of Y chromosomal evidence produces wildly different results to mitochondrial evidence. As recently as Friday, an article by Euclid's Duncan Sayer argued that the reconstruction of DNA based on modern populations is deeply problematic. Whilst this is true, whilst it is true that there is a difficulty arising from investigating the proportion of, of the modern population which shares the genetic markers or rare alleles of those who lived 1500 years ago, especially given that the population has gone through some fairly significant events such as the Justinianic Plague, the Black Death and the 17th century plague, events that may have affected different elements of the population differently. As we saw earlier, James Harland, amongst others, has highlighted the difficulty of associating specific sorts of material culture with specific ethnic behaviours, as well as the development of certain types of material culture from a Mediterranean or Roman type, to a type which Brian Hope Taylor, when he was uh, digging at Yavering, described as diagnostically Anglo-Saxon. These areas are undoubtedly worth consideration, but require a much greater space to do so. As such, I'll leave them for today and move on to urban occupation and burial patterns. Okay, so traditional narratives tend to see a distinct break between the Roman period and the Anglo-Saxon period, suggesting that the occupation of ur urban environs broke down and in many cases ended entirely by the mid-5th century, and towns were refounded de novo by Anglo-Saxon immigrants, sometimes using abandoned urban sites as a useful basis for their new towns. Early discourses about urban occupation at the end of Roman period highlighted the perceived break between Roman levels and what followed. In 1912, Haver Haverfield argued that as Roman Britons retired from the south and east, as Silchester was evacuated, Bath and Roxeter were stormed and left desolate, the very centres of Romanised life were extinguished. Not a single one remained an inhabited town. Such a view was by no means uncommon and was restated by Wheeler and Wheeler in 1936, again by Collingwood and Richmond in the 60s, and Reece, uh, Richard Rees in the 80s. These narratives have different suggestions as far as the end date of this period, but, uh, for example, uh, Wheeler and Wheeler saw evidence in so St Albans for a period of growth at the beginning of the 4th century, followed by a mid-century decline, and 
uh, a view shared by Collingwood and Richmond, but Richard Rees argued that the decline began as early as the second quarter of the third century. With what remained representing administrative villages, places where important political and administrative functions were filled, but lacking the important economic and social functions, and above all the population density associated with the traditional Roman town. Most recent arguments for this early collapse of Roman urban centres have been made by uh, Neil Faulkner, who analysed room, u- room usage and concluded for a very early decline of Roman towns. There's also a counter movement. Uh, which uh, has been challenging this constantly since the 1960s. Uh, figures such as Frere, Wacker, McGuire, Biddle, Ken Dark, the list goes on. Uh, essentially, they highlighted that there were problems as far as the longevity of uh, Roman structures is concerned and their usage, the uh, appearance and use of coinage, uh, the problems with dark <coughs> earth deposits, the nature of the advent of Saxonum, and the difficulties associated with Anglo-Saxon pottery and uh, the use of Anglo-Saxon buildings. Uh, In the very useful 410 volume, which was mentioned earlier, uh, Keith Fitzpatrick Matthews discussed uh, some of the problems associated with Baldock. Some of the remains, some of these themes remain problems within the study of the 5th century to this day. Uh, At Baldock in in Hertfordshire, there was a small urban center in the fourth century and it shows signs of life in the fifth there is no evidence for fifth century found that uh, there was no evidence for fifth century occupation found in earlier excavations at Baldock. going back to what james said about well if there was no uh, fifth century evidence at uh, his site in london uh, no fifth century evidence elsewhere there mustn't be any in his site in london i think something similar probably happened at Baldock. uh Oh, damn it, wrong one. Perhaps of most interest here is the presence of sunken floored buildings, reminiscent of Grubenhäuser in every way except date. This presents a problem. If Bede's Adventus is correct, then these cannot predate 449 and still be a Germanic architectural type. As Fitzpatrick Matthews explains, either early Anglo-Saxon settlement in the region or there is evidence for a Romano-British tr- building tradition parallel to that of the continental, continental Germans, in which case either the chronology we are working from is wrong, or these are not solely indicative of a trans-North Sea settlement. Could these represent a 5th century type which should be removed from ethnic labels, uh, labels perhaps born of economic circumstances? Now, I've got this wonderful picture here, which is just... A little aside, there's a modern method of heating <coughs> homes called ground source heating. They like it in particular on ground designs, which relies on the ability of the earth to retain heat for longer than air and the near constant temperature of the ground at a depth of around 20 feet. Now, I'm not saying that sunken floor buildings originally had their base at 20 feet in the earth, that would be ridiculous. But the fact that they are di- digging down into the earth and sticking a roof over the top could be making use of the principles behind this in a time when the average temperature of, of Europe is dropping. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> in York and Roxeter, we see many of the same patterns of behaviour being played out. In po- it's, uh, both are important Roman centri- uh, centres which experience a 4th century decline. They both have a period of perceived abandonment, either area specific or total, which is marked by dark earth deposits with signs of new occupation on top of these deposits. There are berries, burials occurring within c- city limits and new timber structures. In York, these are interpreted as markers of a new incoming Anglian population. In Roxeter, they're not. Why? Well, Roxeter is a geographically western centre. It has later associations with a Welsh context, and the traditional narrative of early invasion by, popu- uh, by a foreign population, uh, based loosely on the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, would not fit with having got this far west early enough for there to be <coughs> this kind of development at Roxeter arising from foreign influence. Whereas in York, we can see with uh, Maui arrows that we've got uh, an eastern urban centre 
with the later population that's seen as Anglo-Saxon, largely because it fits with the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It's important to note that the urban occupation of the 4th and 5th century is substantially different from the urban occupation of the 2nd century. Arguments made by Rees and Faulkner considering the end of urban occupation in the 4th century or perhaps earlier could reasonably be supported by the evidence in this case and studies. There is a decline. However, if we distance ourselves from a romanticised classical view of urban, uh, urban occupation, we may see a new type of urban, urban occupation moving towards these functioning as elite centres with associated economic functions. The, this could be seen to be an expansion of Rees's administrative villages. The continuing contraction of the occupied area within the wall would be seen compatible within the walls would seem compatible with this interpretation, as the economic cha uh, situation changed in the 4th century, only the rich and powerful and those associated with them could afford to live in these areas, or is it that their power enabled them to prevent others from occupying the same areas? Either way, the power, be the power and the territory became concentrated in the hands of a few rich people within towns thus becoming estates of the rich. Such a situation has also been highlighted on the continent by Avril Cameron, Cameron and Liebschutz. If we extra extrapolate this behaviour to the nth degree, seeing an elite taking control of perhaps formerly important political space, turning it into an estate and using it as the basis of their own authority, such a pattern can be seen played out all over the former provinces of Britannia. We can see this at the military military sites of the northern frontier, the continuing use of villa estates, the reoccupation of Iron and Iron and the reoccupation of Iron Age hill forts in the south and in the southwest and Wales. In this sense, Reese's administrative failure is not uh, administrative villages are not a failure of urban centres, but part of the evolution of political control in keeping with the militarization of elite culture in the late Roman period. The changes of the fifth century seem to be the next phase of this. So burials. So what we have here are the traditional narratives associated with burial. Romans buried west east, in, uh, extended without grave goods, and they're largely Christian in nature. Anglo Saxons, those in the east from the mid fifth century to the early seventh century, generally are seen to have a north south alignment. They have multiple burial type uh, burial types, but extended and crouched are particularly popular. They use grave goods. They tend to be. Uh, they also have a tendency to be cremated, and above all, they are pagan. So, a significant part of the late Roman burial tradition is east-west orientation. As James said earlier, uh, a lot of the uh, burials at Waspeton, I believe it was, are dated based purely on this alignment. Sam Lucy said that late Roman Christian cemeteries are characterised by largely unfurnished burials with the, bur with the bodies laid out in the grave so that their heads were consistently placed at the west end. This seems to be supported by Elizabeth O'Brien's study of burials in the first millennium. Of the 2,975 late Roman extended inhumation burials that she used, 77.4% are aligned with the head at the west end. However, she noted that the large Christian cemeteries at Poundbury, Langhills and Cannington could be seen to skew the result. These represent approximately two-thirds of the sample. With these removed, of the remaining 917, there's a much more ba balanced approach to burial alignment. The biggest single alignment is still with the head to the west. However, there is a general preference for a north-south alignment overall. Right. This could suggest that going into the fifth century and beyond, the traditional preference, which uh, tr traditional preference which continues through the late Roman era, despite <coughs> Christian choices made at the very large century, could once again become the absolute majority right without the continental in influence reduced by the breakdown of Roman authority. Okay, so we've also got other late Roman uh, rights which appear in the Anglo-Saxon period and are seen to be more. Um, more Anglo-Saxon than any other period. So the use of crouch burials. 8% of uh, burials at Bathgate in Sirencester were crouched. 10% at Townsend, Close and Lit Little Spittle, which are just outside Ilchester. However, there was less than 2% at Queensford Farm in Dorchester on, on Thames. There are associations at other 
sites with particular classes of people, like at Trent Home Farm in York, the majority of uh, the people who were buried crouched were children or adolescents. Now, I'm not saying there's anything coherent here, just that the absence of a coherence means that we can't actually draw any firm conclusions about what's going on and what these burial patterns mean when they're applied to other periods. Uh, similar with cremation, prone and decapitation burial, burials also appear. Anyway, moving on. Okay, so then we have West Hesleton. Uh, West Hesleton uh, has a lower percentage of uh, cremation burials than uh, would be expected at, at an Anglo-Saxon site. A lower number of infant burials, although this may be due to um, some be uh, bones being found in Grubenhäuser rubbish deposits, suggesting that there were other less formal methods of burial going on for infants. The general dating of graves is achieved by assemblage, uh, which is a problem that we've seen throughout uh, and has been uh, alluded to by other papers. <coughs> and moving on to grave alignment. At West Hesleton, east-west alignment is favoured. The, um, the angle of which can differ on a case-by-case -case basis, <coughs> largely due to, uh, well, theorised to be due to the result of burying at uh, the set uh, uh, as the sun sets. Uh, looking at this, this also could suggest that more women are dying in winter than men. This uh, may also be an issue of calculating sex based on grave goods. I think the important thing to take from West Hazleton, though, is that there is nothing to indicate that there is either an ethnic or social basis in the uh, bias in the burial alignment overall. Taking one obviously distinct group, the weapons burials, the alignments of the grave shows exactly the same distribution as the sample as a whole. So, at West Hesleton, we have a population which is generally described as Anglo-Saxon, adhering to what had previously been seen as Roman principles of burial. The lack of any distinct correlation between the alignment of graves with other factors indicates that alignment was of less importance to the Anglian population than we tend to believe. And as far as uh, as far as the burial type, uh, Horton, Palisland, and Blades have suggested that in most cases the position of the body appears to have been term determined by no other factor than the shape and size of the hole they were dropping it in. Uh, one more slide, I think. Yeah, uh, anyway, can, can burial might be seen as a mark of change in ethnicity? Uh, the alignment narrative is faulty, is faulty. not all late Roman uh, burials are east-west, uh, not all Anglo-Saxon uh, burials are, are north-south. Extended inhumation seems to be of uh, associated with a particular status, not an <coughs> ethnic marker, as we can see at uh, Trent Home Drive in York. Uh, there seems to be a higher status for adults and the children were buried crouched. West Hesleton uh, extended is only for a small minority. Most were crouched. Okay, several of the apparent markers of change in the 5th century have earlier origins. Many of the burial behaviours are seen to belong to a new ethnic group are being used in Britain in the late Roman period. Burial alignments are seen to denote ethnic behaviours are used throughout both periods. Urban centres could be evolving towards the outcome we see in the 5th century, a militarisation of elite culture leading towards the creation of big men who, in the absence of Roman authority, extend their power bases to become the tyrants who Gildas describes. A perceived abandonment of urban centres could be the abs absence of ex excavation in these elite controlled areas. There is not enough evidence to suggest that there was an ethnic difference between those acting in the east of Britain and the west. Furthermore, there is not the consistency of behaviours amongst those in the east to suggest that the new behaviours are the product of ethnicity. Thanks very much. <laughs>